What am I thinking right now, Mike? Well, what am I thinking, though? You're thinking about pancakes. And what you're thinking about. What? Deduction stuff. Ooh. What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I'm Mike. That, that opener made sense. It worked good, it man. It made sense. We're going to be talking about our top 10 deduction games. Now, yep. we're going to make a point right now that we're not going to add any social deduction games. We'll do that we're list trying later. To figure, yeah, we'll do that list later. We we're trying to figure out like a trader and stuff. We're not going to have any of these. These are mostly just logical deduction games. There's a lot of these games, and I feel like there's more coming out now, which I really like, because I love this genre. It really feels like we're in a, in a kind of a big era of that, especially with a lot of games that are uh, kind of making cooperative deduction, yes. which is really kind of uh, a cool thing to yeah. do. So we're gonna be talking about a bunch of those kinds of games today. Again, anything like social deduction, hidden trader stuff, we'll be in a separate list that we'll yeah. do soon. But let's hop right into some deduction. Okay, we're gonna start off with a kind of deduction party game, and this is gonna be Hughes and Cues. Hughes and Cues is a very interesting, we're not doing heavy deduction here yet, we'll get to those in a little bit, but nonetheless, Hughes and Cues is going to be a game, I will say this, is not gonna be very color colorblind friendly, unfortunately, because it is about color. That is kind of the whole point. So I will, I will put that one out there like that. Um, but if you don't have a uh, color deficiency or hard time seeing color, it's a really interesting game where basically you're gonna be getting some kind of color swatch. The board is this big old gradient of all these different colors and you're gonna be getting a color swatch. And that might be kind of like a, kind of like a foresty green, right? Maybe, maybe a little more yellow or something like that. And then you basically have to give a clue to everyone that is going to hopefully try to point them towards that exact swatch of, in this case, green. So you might be like, Shrek. Like this is a Shrek green, right? This is a very Shrek-y Shrek green. So you say Shrek, and then everyone has these little cones and they will basically put out where they think your swatch is. Because some people are like, no, Shrek is this color. Other people are like, Shrek is way darker green than that. Shrek is over here and they'll each put them out. And then basically you have this like little square, <laughs> kind of like little cage. And you basically put your um, your swatch in the middle of that. And then anyone in, in that um, kind of little area is gonna get points or essentially getting close. I think you get more points if you're like bang on or if you're like right outside the cage. So it's an interesting way of like, again, interpreting things and being like, I man, I thought that was a different color. Or maybe like, I'm totally wrong about what Shrek, what Shrek's shade of green is, but that's what I thought. And I'm the one who gave out the clue. And so it's really, really interesting. It's a very light party game, but I just think it's really fun. And it, and it falls under deduction because you're trying to deduce what, what color is Shrek really. Number nine is bottom of the ninth. This creates the classic scenario. There's, you're in the bottom of the ninth, the home team's up to bat, and you are trying to, as the home team, walk it off. And as the away team, you are trying to pitch and, and get ahead of your, your hitters and strike them out or get them out any which way you can. And what's really interesting is as a two-player game, it's a purely heads up, trying to get into your opponent's mind game, where uh, as the pitcher, say I was the pitcher, I'm gonna choose, am I gonna pitch it high or low and inside or out? Uh, and the hitter is gonna be trying to guess what I'm gonna throw. Uh, and so they have these tokens, each player has tokens, you're gonna select what ultimately you're pitching, which direction, kind of which quadrant are you ultimately focusing on? And if the batter gets one or two of the elements that you put out there correct, they basically, like, I know what this person's throwing, they're sitting on it and they're waiting and just gonna launch. <laughs> and so you are trying to stay ahead of, uh, of of your hitter. Like, do I go back down and in again? Like, you know, getting in their mind, like, will I go there three times in a row? Is the batter gonna choose something just because I haven't changed pitches? And I think that is such a fun, uh, I love any time in games where you're trying to outthink your opponent, you're trying to get into their brain. And this one is such a classic, uh, it's classic to baseball. Like that's what you're doing in baseball. If you're playing is you're trying to think of the sequence of pitches that are coming your way. What is this pitcher known for doing? What's their, what's their, you know, in their arsenal, what's their put out pitch and stuff like that. And you're trying to sit on and guess correctly as to what's gonna be thrown your way. So it does a really great job of recreating that. And I think it's hilarious that if you get a hit, 
you then start rolling dice as a hitter and you need to roll, which is essentially you running down the base path. <laughs> and as the, the, the pitcher, you're trying to uh, roll to kind of throw them out. So I like there's this real time element of like racing to the bags. It just has a lot of fun things that feel uh, baseball-ish, honestly, in a, in a simple way and things that are kind of silly, but it all comes back down to that mind game of like, it's the bottom of the ninth, pitcher versus hitter, who's gonna win? And that's just a beautiful thing. Number eight is gonna be a cooperative deduction game called Mysterium. This is kind of like Clue on steroids. <laughs> it's kind of the best way for us to describe it. I really, really like Mysterium. Mysterium is a game where one player is gonna play as a ghost who unfortunately is dead, as ghosts generally are, and the other players are playing investigators. And the ghost is trying to essentially point the investigators to who killed them, with what and where. So very clue style. And they're gonna do that through these dream cards. They're essentially sending like dream images to these people because you can't really talk. You can't say like, it was Bill with a pipe in the billiard room. Obviously, there's a pipe sticking out of my head. You can't talk, so you're communicating through these dreams. And so if let's say this one character is the one that killed you as the ghost, and let's say they have kind of a blue background on their thing, you might give someone a dream card that has a ton of blue on it to be like, ah, the blue person, the person with blue on it. But there might be a bunch of birds on there. They're like, ooh, the birds are the clue. And you're kind of like, no, no, the birds weren't the clue. The blue was the clue. And so <laughs> you're trying to convey this information, trying to get people to uh, point to person, place, thing. It's very, very fun, but it's that kind of interesting game where this is also one of the games I think it's good for kind of newer people because one person who's more the experienced player can play as the ghost because they're kind of playing like half of the game and then everyone else is kind of playing the other half of the game because they're doing a lot of work as the ghost. Um, so I think it actually kind of lends itself to you're like, if you're kind of the newer gamers, I'll be the ghost y'all can be everyone else. I just think it's really fun. I think it's a really interesting take on this kind of deduction game, especially kind of a clue kind of deduction game. And I just really enjoy it. Number seven is decorum. This is all about designing uh, and decorating your house. Uh, and you have you and it's mostly a two player game, but you could have up to three or four players and you are uh, trying to make sure that the house gets designed in a way that's going to make you happy. There are certain uh, decor uh, things, aesthetics that you like and don't like. Like maybe I really like antique items. <laughs> maybe someone wants a blue bathroom. Really got to have a blue bathroom. Uh, and we aren't being as open as we could be about that. We each have basically these different goals for the house of what we need the house to be like. These rules essentially. And through placing out items, I could place a, uh, you know, a picture in a certain type of room and my roommate will then say, hey, I love that. Or I do not like that at all. Or that's eh, fine, I'm indifferent. And that's all you can communicate. Again, you don't wanna be too forward. You don't wanna offend somebody by saying why you don't like it. But you can say if you like it or not. And from that, I can hopefully deduce what are the rules that you need for this house? And hopefully by placing stuff, my opponent can pick up, or my teammate, I should say. It feels like opponent sometimes. My teammate can figure out what I need for the house. And what's really satisfying about this game is that there is a way for the house to exist where everybody's happy. There is a solve to each puzzle in the game. And that's really satisfying. It's really satisfying to get to the bottom of it and be like, ah, you can't have more than two red things upstairs. Okay, got it. Okay, I can I can make that work. I just need an antique somewhere in the house. I'm gonna put it down here. It's downstairs, it's red, not gonna bother you. <laughs> but again, we can't talk openly about it. So it's really satisfying. I love that the game uh, markets itself as this passive aggressive game. And because of the way you can communicate, it really does feel that way. You're like, why don't you like the things that I like? What's wrong with you? I think this curio is fantastic. <laughs> but again, I can't say why I think it's fantastic. It makes for laughs every time. It's a tricky puzzle, but a satisfying one. That's why we like decorum. Number six is gonna be Decrypto. Decrypto is a weird game. <laughs> It's such, it's so hard to describe Decrypto. Let's see how well I do. 
There's a jump cut right here because I literally had to restart my explanation because I was explaining it so badly. <laughs> this is hard, it's a weird game. So basically what's gonna happen is each team, there's a team game, you are going to have a series of four words. So it could be like dog, uh, house, uh, monkey, and cutting board. I don't know, four things. <laughs> Those are the four things I thought of. Wow, good job, Nick. Um, and then basically each round you're gonna be giving a sequence of numbers. So it might be like, four, two, one. So what you need to do is you need to then give a clue to your team that's going to have them guess the fourth word, two, second word, and then the first word. And so, I don't remember how examples were, but as you give out three, three things, and you're trying to then get them to guess those in that order. But the other team is listening. And as you give more clues as the game goes on, let's say the clue was like house. You could say like yard. Yard goes with house, right? You could say like family, whatever. But as you're giving out more clues, the other team goes, okay, I, we don't, they obviously don't know what your word is, but they're like, okay, f yard, family, you know, dog, cat, children, da, da, that might all be house, right? Like bedroom, da, 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 these things, that all might be leading to the same thing, or at least I think all of those clues are related. And so when you're giving out, when the team is gonna be guessing the sequence, at, you can basically try to guess the other team's sequence before they do. So you're like, okay, I have enough clues. I think, I think the sequence is four, two, one. And then if you're correct, you're gonna essentially get a point. And you're trying to get, I believe, two points to win. But nonetheless, it's, it's, again, it's very weird and hard to describe. <laughs> but basically, you're trying to, when you're giving your team clues, they can see the words. So like, they, you're not trying to get them to guess the words, you're trying to get them to guess the sequence. You're basically trying to give them clues that will point them to the right sequence, but are weird and obscure enough that the other team can't point out what clues are with what other clues from previous rounds. It's very weird and it's hard to describe to people, but it's really, really fun and it works really well. Scorby Mask, who makes the game, just are constantly thinking outside the box. And I really liked it, Crypto. Hopefully it did an okay job describing it. It's a weird one, but I absolutely love it. Number five is the game that shredded my mind harder than just about anything I've played in as long as I can remember. This is Hooky. This is a game where you are trying to figure out uh, which three letters from the alphabet are not present in the game. You have all 26 in play, uh, and at the start of the game, I'm gonna get a hand of some of those cards that have letters, and so I will know right away that I have certain letters that are present in school today. That's the theme is that these, these letters are all names of kids and three of the kids are missing. They are not in school today. Uh, so based on my starting information of like, I know that these letters are in my hand, so therefore they are not the ones that are missing from the game. You are gonna then start asking clues of other people around the table by giving a five letter word. So I might give prose, for example, P-R-O-S-E, and I might ask my brother Nick about that. Hey, pros, does that make any matches for you? And then Nick will take a look at his letters and see, does pros, maybe P and E are two of Nick's letters. And Nick will say, that matches two, twice for me. That's two matches for me. Now, I don't know which of the letters are the match, uh, but I know that two of them are, but maybe I have R and O. And uh, you know, and so now I know that, okay, P, S, and E, two of those are Nick's. I know two that aren't because those are mine or I already deduced that those are someone else's letters and stuff like that. And you're starting to deduce it down. Now what's really cool is if I go out and I say that uh, clue, everybody else at the table hears that clue, hears the response and gets to write down information based on that. So even if it's not my turn, I'm gaining a ton of information throughout the game. So it is actually possible to start to whittle down which letters are possible that aren't present. So it's one that like, I played it late one night, which was a mistake. <laughs> like it gets so brain fry as I try to, you know, look back. If I learn someone has an H or something, I try to look back at all of their clues. Uh, what else can I learn from that? I look at, you know, what everyone else has put. Okay, well I know H can't be there. So what does that give me about their letters? This is a, for me anyway, high focus kind of game, but it's so, so fun to have deduction that's letter based. I, I find like mostly we find deduction that is, you know, in different areas, but I never found one that's based on words, which is really, really fun. So that's hooky.
Number four is gonna be essentially two games and I think coming up three games soon. This is gonna be the search for da da da. So the search for Planet X or the search for lost species or the search for like aliens? They're not called aliens, but something. Some alien one is coming up this year. And I'm so freaking excited about that game because I love these games. Particularly the search for lost species, which is the newest one. I've been playing that one non-stop at home. I just have it permanently set up on my kitchen table and I've been playing it a ton because it's really good solo. So the search for lost species will say, in this case, you are looking for this lost species. And these are all logic deduction games. And so basically the lost species is gonna have some kind of logic rule. So like the logic, the logic rule might be like, this species is not in the same terrain type as like the Python. And then in this kind of map of world, there are gonna be all these different animals that you're seeing as you're searching for the lost species. And all the different animals will have logic rules to them. So the Python is never next to a couscous. That's the logic rule for the Python. Couscous are kind of like marmots. They're like little, like, I don't know, marsupials, not marsupials. They're kind of like big rodents. I don't know. They're cute though. And then the couscous, their logic rule is that they are all with, there's three couscouses in the game. They're all within two of each other. So you know if you find one couscous, you know the other two are within two somewhere around that one. Also, if you find a couscous, you know that the python can't be in any spot connected to that because the python is never adjacent to the couscous. And so you have all these different animals that all have their own logic rules. And as you find them and discover them on this kind of island, you then can start to deduce what is where and specifically what can't be in certain places. And then as you deduce that down, you then can figure out where the lost species is. And it's so much fun. The search for Planet X is very similar, but you are searching for Planet X. And in this case, there's like asteroids and gas clouds and like planets and all of them have their own logic rules. Like the asteroids always are next to each other. So if you find one asteroid, you know the other three are somehow connected to it. So you basically can figure out where these things are. It's so much fun. If you like logic deduction games, it's just so, you get those dopamine hits of like, you find something else out, you're like, oh wait, because I know that, that means this can't be here, which means it has to be here. <gasps> okay, cool. And then you start to like, you just get these like puzzle pieces dropping into the puzzle and it's just so darn satisfying. I freaking love these games. I cannot get enough of them. Number three is a pure logic deduction game where you're trying to find a three number code. This is Turing Machine. This is a game that creates a a physical computer, <laughs> essentially, where you are going to uh, be trying to get a three number code uh, using certain verifiers. There's basically verifiers that are gonna tell you the rules of the code. Uh, and you will have certain ones for a certain game and then these different cards that you kind of check against. Uh, and it might be one is just that the yellow number, the second number in the clue is either uh, less than four, equal to four, or higher than four. Uh, and so when I make a clue, if I have like two, one, three, so the one is my yellow number, and I go and test uh, that against it, and I get an X, meaning that no, it's not true, that's because I have a one, that means that it is not true that the yellow is less than four, because that's what it's asking. The number that I che checked with is less than four. That is not correct, so I know that it's not one, two, or three. It could still be four or five. So it's not gonna give you necessarily a specific answer, but it'll tell you what, if what you're asking is within the parameters of the rules or not, and from that, you can kind of cross-check a bunch of stuff and get to a three-number code. One thing I really enjoy about this game, and in general you've seen on this list, is if there is a definitive answer to the puzzle. In Turing Machine, there is never a, it's this or that. If you have a situation, it's either this or that, you've done something wrong. Like you will, you will get to a specific answer. Every puzzle, which there are millions because it's kind of algorithmically generated, uh, will have a specific answer. So it's very satisfying to go from, you know, not a whole lot of information, just the kind of verifiers I can test and having that kind of cascading moment where you're like, wait, this thing can't be one, two, or three. There has to be two odd numbers. So maybe that means that the first and third number are odd and the next one here is the four and stuff like that. So there's all these ways that you kind of rush toward the answer really quickly once you have some pieces of information. It's very satisfying every time. It's one that I can just do forever. Uh, there's a new daily puzzle every day. It's amazing, that's Turing Machine.
Number two is a solo game called Black Sonata. Black Sonata is about you trying to find the mysterious woman who, um, the serious woman who inspired Shakespeare's black sonnets. So the dark sonnets, there's a mysterious woman who inspired all of these sonnets and you're basically trying to find out who that is. And so you're going around London trying to find this mysterious woman. And you're basically being like, who are you? <laughs> is what you're kind of more or less doing. But it's a deduction game because as you are coming across, you're basically, it's a hidden solo, hidden movement deduction game because the woman is moving around the city of London. You're basically trying to follow her and basically trying to get her piece on the board to come to your piece because on your turn, you can either confront her and say like, who are you? Or you can move, but you can't do both. So you can't, even if you know where she is, you can't move to where she is and then confront her. She has to move to you. So you're basically trying to move to where she is and she's gonna be moving in a certain sequence done by these cards. But then whenever you do find her, you successfully find where she is, you're gonna get some piece of information about her because there are, I think in the game, like 12 different people that it could be, and they all have different attributes. They might be wearing a ring, which means they're they're married. They might have kids with them, which means they have kids. They might, they might be musically inclined. I assume they're just carrying a tuba. <laughs> I don't know how you knew that just by glancing at them, but apparently you, maybe they were singing at the time, but they might be a writer. You're basically finding out little pieces of information about them and you are trying to deduce which one is the correct one. And you'll do that by again, finding out the different information and canceling people out based off of certain things. You're like, oh, well, I know. I know for a fact that she's married. So that means this character can't be it because um, they are not married or something like that. And so it's really, really fun. And it's just this kind of cat and mouse game of trying to get where they are. And the nice thing about the hidden movement part is the hidden move, finding where she is is not difficult. The difficult part is, is being where she's gonna go to. Because a lot of times she's gonna go and she can either move to here or to here. And you're like, I hope she moves to me. And then she moves to somewhere else. You're like, okay. And you gotta get to a spot where she goes to and then confront her and then do the deduction on top of that. And so that mix of like not super heavy deduction and not super heavy worker um, hidden movement rather, those two things together make a really interesting game. I really like Black Sonata a lot. It's an absolute blast and you should try it. Our number one is Paint the Roses. This is a, a cooperative deduction game that we've just really been loving on for the last couple years. Uh, this is a game where you are trying to uh, complete the, the Queen of Hearts. You're in the Alice in Wonderland world. You're trying to complete the Queen's garden uh, before she hunts you down and chops your head off. So it's a little bit macabre, uh, but you are <laughs> uh, doing this by giving subtle clues to your teammates about what the queen has told you specifically she wants the garden to be like. Now she's told everyone around the table different things about the garden. And so what might work for me might not work for someone else, but we have to try to communicate quietly because we don't want the queen to know what we're up to because we're trying to escape the garden, frankly. Uh, we need to be kind of subtle in our clue giving. So you're placing out tiles on a turn and each tile will have a color of rose bush and then a the bush itself will be one of the suits of cards. So clubs, hearts, uh, things like that. When you place down a tile, any adjacent tiles that make a match for you. So say I have yellow to pink. I have yellow roses to pink roses. I place a tile with pink roses and there's two yellow roses adjacent. I'll put down two cubes saying that this placement makes two matches for me. And then anyone else around the table who makes a match for them, they'll place cubes as well. And then every turn you have to guess one person's whim, which is the, the, the rules they've been given by the queen. So you have to make at least one guess. If you are correct, you get to move your gardeners around the edge of the board, which means you're further away from the queen, which is always good. If you're incorrect, your turn ends immediately and the queen moves twice as fast as she would normally. She's moving every turn regardless, but she moves twice as fast. You're starting to hear that you guys are rumoring back and forth and stuff like that. So uh, it is one that, you know, seems kind of impossible to start a little bit. And then you kind of find ways to be really strategic. It's sometimes not about the tile that you place, but about what tiles didn't you place? Or if I place it way over here, why did I place it way over here, not a place that makes more matches for me? What is that kind of uh, communicating? There's a lot of things you can 
communicate very subtly. And as you play more, I feel like it starts to reward you more and more uh, in finding ways to be really clever and specific with the clues you give. It's just really well done. The art is beautiful. It's such a great production. Um, and the cooperative uh, deduction of it all is really satisfying. And I like that your whims are constantly changing, so it just feels really kind of dynamic as you go. And it's a tough puzzle to solve because you really can't afford to miss a lot because the queen will be on you so quickly. <laughs> so that is uh, Paint the Roses. So that's the top 10 deduction games. Did you deduce what was gonna be on the list? Probably. Probably. Yeah, yeah. these are really, I, this is a, a genre that I, I'm, I'll be completely honest, I used to not really like. Yeah. And I have, in the last year or two, have really started to love these kinds of games. There's just something inherently satisfying yeah. about it all. You, you know, know what dopamine I mean? hits where you're like, <gasps> Yeah. <gasps> you get to feel <laughs> like, clever. I think it's yeah. something in games in general that you and I like is yeah. a moment where you get to feel like you got to do something clever, strategic or whatever in deduction games uh, give you a lot of those moments for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So that is our top 10 deduction games. Let us know down in the comments deduction games that you really, really enjoy. Which ones weren't on our list? Please let us know because we want to know more of these kinds of games. Until next time, I'm Nick. I'm Mike. We're the Brothers Murphy. We'll see you later, everybody.